Hi, and welcome to this video on dimension and rank, two important terms connected with the idea of a basis. So looking here on the screen, you see three sets of vectors in R2. Each of these ve sets of vectors is linearly independent, as you can readily check, and will span all of R2. So you know what that makes each of these three guys here. Each of these three sets would be a basis for R2. They look very different. Uh, but each one would be considered a basis for R2, again, because this, each set is linearly independent, and each set spans all of R2. The first one up here is the standard basis for R2. The other two are non-standard, but again, uh, the way to check to see that these are bases for R2 is put them into a 2x2 two two matrix, and you'll see that they will uh, reduce to the identity matrix, all of them. So bases for R2 can look like a lot of different things, but one thing that they can't look like are larger or smaller sets than this. Let's just kind of imagine what would happen if I took one of these bases and put in a third vector into that slot there. So if I get three or more vectors in this set, it's suddenly no longer going to be linearly independent because I would have three, four, or more vectors in R2. And uh, any set of three or more vectors from R2 is automatically linearly dependent, and that disqualifies it from being a basis. That set might still span all of R2, but it wouldn't be a basis because of the linear dependence. Now, on the other hand, if I removed one of those vectors, let's say I took one of those vectors out and only kept the first one. Now, that would be a set of one non-zero vector, which is, by definition, linearly independent, so that's great. But it wouldn't span all of R2 either. That one vector would merely span a line in R2. So it wouldn't be a basis either if I took out one of those vectors. Uh, because I would have linear independence, but I wouldn't have the spanning property that a basis should have. So one thing that we can see here, and it's a very important but sort of intuitively obvious fact, and that is, although I can come up with many, many different bases for R2, every basis for R2 must have something in common, namely they have to have exactly two things in them. Every basis for R2 must have exactly two vectors in it. Must have two vectors. Now, not every two-vector set would be a basis, but if you have a basis, it must have exactly two things in it. And I think that this makes it intuitively clear. If I had three or more vectors in R2, that would uh, fail to be linearly independent. If I had fewer than two vectors, that would fail to span. And we can actually extend this to a larger result here, and I'm going to state this as a theorem. It's stated in your book as a theorem. To uh, say to say the following. Every basis for any subspace H, whether it's all of R, N, or not, uh, any subspace has the same number of elements. Any basis for a subspace H in R, N has the same number of vectors. So if you find one basis, if you have a subspace H and Rn, and you find that it has a basis with, say, six elements in it, then any basis you find for H will have six elements in it. They may not be the same six elements, but they will be six of them, just as we saw with our example with R2. Now, we have a definition that arises out of this fact here. Uh, since the number of vectors in a basis for a subspace is always the same, as long as the subspace is the same, we're going to give that number a, a, uh, a name here. So the number of vectors, the number of vectors in a basis for H, H being a subspace, is uh, we're going to call that the dimension of H. The dimension of H. Okay, And we're going to abbreviate that with DIM of H. So again, the dimension of H is just the number of vectors in any basis for H. And that number is invariant. It doesn't matter what the basis looks like. It will always have the same number of elements in it. One thing to note here, just as a uh, small special case here, the uh, dimension of the empty set is said to be zero. Now let's do some examples here of calculating dimensions here with some familiar subspaces. First of all, let's look at the subspace H of R2 being the line Y equals X, 4X in R2. We looked at this example in an earlier video. Uh, this is indeed a subspace uh, for, for reasons that we explained there. It's just the line that goes through the origin with slope 4. 
Now, what is the dimension of h? Well, to find this out, we need to go and find a basis for h. And we actually did that uh, before in an earlier video. A basis for h would be, um, well, one basis would be the set consisting of the single vector 1, 4. And we explained why back in an earlier video, but just to recap, that single vector set is linearly independent by definition, and it spans the entire line. Every point on that line is just a scalar multiple or linear combination of this one vector. Now, to find the dimension of H, all I have to do is just look in that basis and count, okay, how many vectors are in that basis? one of them, so the dimension of that space is one. Now this agrees very much so with our intuition. We would definitely like to say that a line in R2 is one-dimensional. Even though it sits inside a two-dimensional world, the line itself is one-dimensional. Okay, and that is certainly the case here if I follow the definitions. Now here's another uh, example here, pardon my drawing, I tried to make this as good as possible. The thing about R3, which is three-dimensional space, and just look at the xy plane here. That is uh, this stuff here along the x-axis and y-axis, sort of like the flat, the floor in R3. What's its dimension? Well, all we have to do is come up with a basis for this uh, subspace, and I think you'll find that a basis for this particular subspace would be the following set of vectors. You can use the set consisting of 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. Now, every point that is in the xy plane will have, uh, it'll look something like that. Every vector will look something like a, b, 0. And will be no, uh, it'll have a 0 third component, possibly some numerical stuff in the first and second components. And that uh, can be obtained by linearly combining those two vectors. So this set will form a basis for the xy plane in R3. And now to find the dimension of that, uh, subspace, I just got to count the number of vectors in it, and of course that's two in this case. And again, this agrees with our intuition. Although we're thinking about something inside three-dimensional space, the subspace itself is flat. It's a plane. It has no height to it of sorts, and so we would like to say that's two-dimensional, and the definition allows us to do that. Finally, just a sort of extreme case here, what if you looked at all of Rn? What is the dimension of Rn? Well, I have an idea what we would like to say it is, but let's make sure the definition agrees with us. So again, let's just get a basis for Rn, and one very easy basis is the standard basis for Rn. So that would be the set consisting of the columns of the n by n identity matrix. I won't list them all completely like this, but the important thing is how many of them are there. So I'm going to keep doing this until I reach uh, this last vector here. So how many are there? What is the dimension of Rn? Well, I just gotta count the vectors, and there are n of them. So the dimension of Rn is indeed n, and of course that definitely agrees with our intuition. We'd love to say that the dimension of R3 is three, for example, and that would certainly be the case. Now let's apply this idea to the column space and the null space of a matrix. So those two are subspaces, and we just got through in an earlier video discussing how to find a basis for those two subspaces. So that sets us up to find the dimension of those two subspaces, and this becomes pretty important a little bit later on. So here's a, let's revisit an example we saw in an earlier video where A is this 3 by 3 matrix in the black, and in the green off to its right I have the reduced row echelon form of A. So let's find the dimension of the column space and the dimension of the null space of A. These are going to be two numbers, right? Uh, that would just be the number of vectors in the column space, in a basis for the column space, and the number of vectors in a basis for the null space. Well, we saw earlier that the column space uh, a basis for the column space, for this thing right here, a basis uh, just consists of the pivot columns of A, pivot columns of A. We actually found that basis earlier. I'm just going to kind of highlight those in blue up here. These two guys right here were uh, will form basis for the column space of A. If I just want the dimension, I just need to count the number of vectors there are. So the number of vectors in that basis is 2, therefore the dimension of the column space is 2. Now I just want to point out here that the dimension of the column space of the matrix goes by a special name that is called the rank of A, like the rank in uh, the army of an officer as the dimension of its column space. The, again, the, the rank of a matrix is just another word for the dimension of the column space of that matrix. The rank of a matrix turns out to be a pretty important number, as we will see in a later section. So the rank of this particular matrix A is 2.
Now back to uh, dimension. What is the dimension of the null space of this matrix? Well, uh, we had to find out what the basis for that null space was, I needed to actually come up with the solution vector for uh, the equation ax equals zero. Okay, and just to recap what we did here, we had x1, x2, and x3. We saw from the reduced row echelon form up here that x3 was free, x1 was equal to negative x3, x2 is equal to negative 2x3, and x3 was free, of course. And so that allowed me to write like this, x3 times the vector negative 1, negative 2, 1. And what we pointed out in the earlier video was the vector that shows up, the numerical vector that shows up in the solution is the basis for the null space of A. There's only one of those, and so the basis for the null space, or sorry, the dimension of the null space in this case is 1. There's one vector in that null space. Let's look at one more example here where we're dealing with the rank and the dimension of the null space of a matrix, and we'll see that you might be picking up on this already. There's a little bit of a shortcut we can use to calculate those two numbers. Here's another example we saw of a 3 by 5 matrix, and let's calculate its rank and the dimension of its null space. Now, we don't actually have to come up with a basis for either of these two spaces, column space or null space. I just need to come up with a way of knowing how many elements there are in each. Now, you might wonder, how could you do one without the other? But let's just take a look at the reduced row echelon form over here in the green and see. Now, I can see that the rank of B, the dimension of its column space, is going to be 3. Now, how do I know this is going to be 3? Well, the, the rank of B refers to the number of vectors in a basis for the column space. Okay, Where do those vectors come from? They come from the pivot columns. This one, this one, and this one, and those refer to these three columns over here. Those three vectors there would form a basis for the column space of B. I don't really need to know what they are, I just need to know how many of them there are. Okay, so there are three pivot columns. I can see that by looking at the pivot positions in the reduced row echelon form. So the number of pivot columns I get here will be the rank of B. All right. Now, what is the dimension of the null space? Well, we don't need to write out, we did a fairly lengthy and thorough job of specifying a basis for the null space of B in the previous video, but we don't have to go through all that again to get the answer here of what, what the dimension of the null space is. Because let's think about how, how that solution worked out. The basis for the null space basically corresponded to the free variables. Okay, I had x4 and x5 here are free, and if you think back to just generally how that solution worked itself out, I've got the parametric form for the solution to bx equals 0. Okay, and we worked all that out, and we found that we had two vectors okay, uh, that were in the basis for the null space of B. One of them corresponded to x4, one of them corresponded to x5. Basically, the number of free variables in this matrix here it will be the dimension of its null space because that's how the solution works out. Each free variable determines a numerical vector that goes into the basis for that null space. So I'm going to have a dimension of the null space equaling 2. Now there's even a shorter shortcut to this because if you look at the columns of a matrix, I'll, I'll highlight both the original and the reduced echelon form. Every column is going to eventually correspond to one of two things. It's going to be either a pivot column or something that is determines a free variable. If it's a pivot column, then that will contribute to the column space of B. If it's a free variable, it will contribute to the null space of B. So every one of these five columns will either go into determining the rank of B or the null space of B. And you might well notice that if I take 3 plus 2 and add them together, of course I get 5, and that's the total number of columns in the matrix itself. And this gives us a very important theorem here. If A is an M by N matrix, okay, so N is the number of columns that I have here, then I have this relationship here. The rank of A plus the dimension of the column space of A, of the null space of A, sorry, will have to add together to equal N. And that's a very important theorem, and I think you get the intuitive idea of it behind here, that every column in a matrix is either a pivot column, and so its count contributes to the rank, or it corresponds to a free variable, and its count contributes to the dimension of the null space. And so we have this result here that allows me to very quickly determine uh, the uh, rank or dimension of the null space.